Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stepp and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, we learn about some exciting medical innovations in nanotechnology. Our distinguished guests leads a research team that's been receiving a lot of praise lately. Dr. Samir Sankusali is Professor of Electrical Engineering at Tufts University. He serves on editorial boards and on committees of professional organizations and conferences. Dr. Sankusali's NanoLab is famous for cutting edge research in multiple interdisciplinary areas and especially for nano devices that benefit medicine and the life sciences. Tonight, Dr. Sankusali explains how nanotechnology works and particularly how it's revolutionizing medicine. The example of interest is the Nano Lab's development of flexible embedded sensors for diagnostics, especially a sensor device called Smart Thread. In addition to the Nano Lab's technical innovations, we'll talk about the Sankusali team's commitment to creating zero cost, do it yourself diagnostics for the developing world. And now we're honored to welcome Samir Sankusali. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. And I wonder if you would start us off with a little background about what nanotechnology is, because it's unfamiliar to a number of people. So uh, nanotechnology uh, uh, is the ability to manipulate and use uh, matter or materials uh, at an extremely smaller scale. And we are basically talking about uh, materials uh, which are a few, nan uh, few atoms, uh, um, atoms wide. Uh, and the whole field of nanoscience and nanotechnology has come about because uh, of the technological advances we've had mm. recently where we can now uh, literally print things that are that small uh, and uh, can fabricate devices and have a uh, um, lot of precision in the way we uh, monitor, we, um, uh, control the matter. And so, uh, as you're aware, the term nanotechnology came about with the Richard Feynman's lecture in 1965, where he talked about uh, the fact that there is plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, he, he was essentially mentioning uh, uh, a lot of possibilities where we could store uh, lots of information uh, at an atomic scale. Uh, he was talking about uh, things that we can manipulate, computation that we can perform, uh, at unprecedented scale. And uh, even though the term was coined, uh, I think, around 1980s or so, uh, uh, the real uh, research only happened lately when, uh, when as I mentioned, we had uh, uh, technological advances that allowed us to uh, manipulate matter at that scale. So the concept was well known, was yeah. very familiar, and then you just had to wait for the technology. So uh, it's amazing how we've actually, uh, the people, the civilization over many years have been actually using nanotechnology and uh, they were not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, look at these beautiful stained glasses that you see uh, in, 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 in churches in Europe and uh, across the world, uh, uh, these glasses do not really have chemical dyes in them. They are essentially uh, uh, metals uh, yeah. that have been embedded into glass. Like gold and uh, go silver. Gold, silver, yeah. copper. They tried all different kinds of alloys and metals and they gave out beautiful colors yeah. and, uh, and they realized that they could make amazing uh, uh, glasses. They also made vase uh, that were beautiful. So they, uh, we've been making uh, nanoscale devices uh, using nanoscale no materials way. for a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's really fascinating. It's only now that we begin to understand precisely what's happening uh, at nanoscale with uh, atomic force microscopy, yeah. uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, and the measurement instruments that we have today, we are able to see what's happening at those scales 
and understand the phenomenon uh, going on and which brings uh, to uh, the properties of nanoscale materials. Yes. Uh, and so uh, the bulk materials, when you look at materials that are big, uh, they have different properties than when they actually become really small. Okay. Uh, uh, things that are very stiff uh, cannot be bent when you make them nanoscale uh, can exhibit flexibility. Uh. Things that are not chemically reactive in bulk form become chemically reactive when they are uh -huh. in nanoscale. And if you can even have materials that have completely different properties uh, compared to their bulk, uh, 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 you know, uh, solid. Uh, counterpart. So, uh, looking at this, there are a lot of possibilities, uh, you know, that you can uh, envision for these kind of materials. I see. I wanted to talk about the materials, sure. but uh, the the advantage that you're, you, I, it seems as though by working at the very small, aside from things like circuits, mm -hmm. uh, mm. uh, and what you're going to be concerned mm. with a lot with mm. the medical exactly. devices, that is that you can shrink things, mm. and as Feynman said you could put encyclopedias mm -hmm. on a t you know in a few yeah. atoms and and so on so that's one thing would be information and perhaps some information processing mm -hmm. and stuff are there any difficulties with working at that scale I think of like at the quantum level I think things are radically mm. is it possible different or do you not have to worry about that Yes, so uh, when we talk about nanotechnology, we still have different scales. Uh -huh, uh, right. uh, so we, we are still talking about materials that are few atoms wide. Okay. Uh, uh, there are molecules, uh, yeah. and so something of the size of a nanometer can still hold uh, mul uh, thousands of atoms. Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, and so, uh, of course, uh, one of the important uh, properties at nanoscale are the quantum effects. Uh, okay. uh, and uh, there are a lot of possibilities there. Uh, but what we are looking at is our essentially uh, uh, electronic transport yeah. uh, at those, at the scale. And that uh, when, you make when you make things that small, uh, you do have uh, electronic transport happening at much faster much speeds. Faster. Uh, and so, uh, if you look at uh, our computing uh, power that yeah. we have in our computer today is basically because these transistors uh, that are responsible for electronic transport, they control uh, electronic transport, they turn them on and off, the switches uh, yeah. that go, that form the underlying fundamental unit of any circuitry are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, the Intel is able to make 10 nanometer uh, transistors. That's, uh, that's yeah. incredible. It's, it's like saying the entire New York and Manhattan in all in the chip with yeah. all yeah. Uh, the traffic yeah. essentially ferrying electrons around and we get amazing speed, the computing power uh, in, uh, in, in our desktops and in our laptops in our mobile phone. And that can be attributed in some way in our ability to make things at nanometer scale. Yes. So we do say nanometer scale transistors and nanometer scale devices. Uh, and also the same technology can be used to make uh, things for uh, applications in medicine and life sciences. Yes. So that's where basically we've been working on. That's in our group. right. Let's go to that <laughs> there for sure. sure. Because this is really exciting. There's a lot happening and we don't get a lot of information from the media. So mm -hmm. I have this impression that mm -hmm. people are not too aware mm -hmm. of what's going on and it's extremely important. The, yes. the, the whole new areas. So uh, your lab covers a lot of territory, mm -hmm. but uh, could you tell us about the medical innovation in particular, the smart thread, and then we can add, uh, talk about some other stuff? Exactly. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in my group, uh, we've been uh, motivated by uh, an inherent uh, sort of a problem or challenge in uh, medicine and life sciences, which is uh, can we interface with tissues and organs and even at single cell level? Uh, can we interface at that level? Given that we've had so much advances in nanotechnology, we should be at the stage where we can interact with cells, tissues, and organs uh, at, that, uh, at their scale. Because the cells are still micron size, they're mm -hmm. not nanometer mm -hmm. scale. Uh, and so we've looked at, uh, my background has been on making uh, circuits, uh, 
uh, at the, and miniaturizing them. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see, and we call this microelectronics, and now the term is nanoelectronics for making things I smaller. See. So how do we use microelectronics and nanoelectronics to address this challenge of interfacing with cells, organs, and tissues? Uh, and so we've been making uh, sensors uh, that can sense the cells and the tissues and organs. We've been making uh, devices that read what the cells are doing uh, and the tissue are doing. And I, I have to say that beyond uh, the activity that's going on in my group, there has been a lot of advances yeah. Yeah. in the field of nanotechnology in this particular frontier. People have been able to use nanoparticles, load them with drugs, and move these particles to uh, places like tumors yeah. and then use external light to sort of release the drug because it heats up the particles oh my goodness. and kill the tumors. So this is a whole field of photodynamic therapy ah. and that relies on gold nanoparticles and some of the silver nanoparticles. Uh, there are many other applications. Uh, you could also, people have made the sensors that can that are sensitive to single molecule, a presence of single molecule in its environment. And that would not have been possible with yeah. larger scale. Yeah, right, you have right, to have right. devices that are essentially. And so in our group, we looked at all these advances and been also investigating uh, approaches where we can use nanoscale materials and nanoscale phenomenon for precisely doing this, interfacing with cells, tissues, and organs. Ah, and this took you, for example, to the smart, smart thread threads. that's gotten so much press yes. uh, lately. Could we know about this? Because this is, this is such a good example of the sensing that is of huge value to the medical uh, community, yes. trying to monitor surgery patients and so yeah. on, I guess. Yes, so before uh, I explain uh, what's on the slide, uh, uh, what we have here is uh, a technology, a platform, uh, and I, I like to call it a toolkit uh. Uh, uh, of uh, thread-based devices. Uh, so we, uh, again, uh, with the same motivation of interfacing intimately with cells, tissues, and organs, we asked ourselves, uh, what would it take to make sensors that can be embedded uh -huh. inside the tissues, uh, into the body? And uh, if you look at the sensors or the devices that you see around today, they are typically made on hard materials. Yes. And they, they, and they are uh, not flexible. Right. Uh, and they are, uh, and you can never really see them interfacing uh, with uh, tissues. Like uh, inside, uh, yeah, the, in, internal tissues. Internal mean. tissues, uh, something that, it doesn't have to be even internal, even on the surface. Yes, uh, right. Something that conforms, yeah. has the same physical yeah. properties as the tissue itself. And uh, so we asked ourselves, how, why is this not possible? And what would be the solution? What would it take to make yeah, yeah. Uh, something? And this answer was uh, surprisingly simple. Uh, we realized that one material, one particular uh, platform that can be sutured into the tissue would be the best uh, solution. So we came up with looking at making threads smarter. So we have cotton threads, we have synthetic threads, we have rubber <laughs> threads, and we've been using this for many years and for centuries. But what would it take to make these threads smarter so that we can then do things that threads haven't been used before. Haven't been trained to I've use. Haven't been trained to use before. <laughs> so uh, one application where we always, uh, we know about are sutures. Uh, yeah. Surgeons typically suture yeah. uh, wounds uh, regularly and uh, um, and if you, uh, if you heard, uh, um, surgical procedures typically have uh, problems with infection. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, patient or goes back home, and the surgical site gets infected, and uh, it's sometimes too late uh, to uh, undo uh, what has happened. So, wouldn't it be nice if these threads uh, were able to sense and tell the doctor that the surgical site is actually getting infected? not just infected, it's getting inflamed, something else is wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so uh, 
uh, that's essentially uh, one of the applications that we were also thinking about, which is how do you uh, add sensing functions uh, to these threads. So we basically took these threads and had uh, nanomaterials embedded into them. So what we have in this slide uh, is a cartoonish representation of one of the application of threads which is to monitor chronic wounds. Mm -hmm. So you have threads uh, that uh, penetrate uh, the epidermis and the dermis layer and uh, they're essentially uh, sutured in by okay. a surgeon. Okay. Literally. So uh, this is like a piece of uh, this your... This is like a cross yes, section exactly. of the skin. Uh, the, yeah, okay. yeah and, and so these threads uh, go all the way in and uh, 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 the threads have a natural wicking property uh, because threads are naturally hydrophilic, we call them. Uh -huh. They essentially have a tendency to have capillary flow through them. I see. So you don't really need a syringe or an injector to pump the liquid out. If you can put these threads, these uh, specially treated threads that make them hydrophilic into the tissue, they will bring the interstitial fluid out. That's, that's basic. That's yeah. basically the first interesting property of the thread that we harnessed, uh, the natural capillary flow uh, in, uh, in, in the thread. And these threads, uh, the, when these fluids are then brought to other threads, and these threads are the sensing threads. So the liquid goes from inside right. the body to these sensing threads. And the sensing threads here are shown as they could be physical sensors, they can yeah. monitor temperature, they can monitor whether strain, they can monitor pH. They can also monitor glucose. They can monitor biomarkers of inflammation. Yeah, right. And once they sense this, the electronic output that is generated is then routed to a circuit board, a small tiny circuit board that's sitting on top of the skin. Ah. And so that's basically shown on the top yes, right. And yes. that's where the signal goes and then it wirelessly transmits through a phone. So you can imagine now, it's like a Fitbit, but yeah, it's one that's right. embedded within right. your uh, within within the tissue to provide you with a lot more diagnostic information. Right. And so we targeted this for chronic wounds, uh, yeah. monitoring chronic wounds and to make sure that they are healing and to monitor whether they're healing. That is really amazing. That's better than anything out mm -hmm. there, I would imagine, because mm -hmm. you've got instant information. Yes. Is there any risk with that, with the thread? It's with this, with the smart thread, does is any possibility of a problem with it? Or Very good question. And so this is an ongoing uh, area of research, uh, but threads come in many forms. Exactly. Uh, and uh, threads uh, are, they, you know, surgical threads, for example, uh, come in forms where once you uh, suture them in, they biodegrade, they, yeah. they, yeah. Uh, they, are, they are resorbed by the body, uh, but there are nylon threads um, uh, which are also used by, uh, by uh, surgeons uh, regularly. So we've started with those threads that are known to be biocompatible. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, all we have done is coated them with different sensing materials, okay. which are uh, based on different nanomaterials. And so we do have to think about possible toxicity from these nanomaterials. Uh, yes, right, yeah. And so that's an ongoing research uh, uh -huh. that we have to uh, look into. But the materials we have used so far, uh, we've tried them on rats uh, in yeah, vitro right, and yeah. we've done some uh, tissue cul uh, cell culture on in a petri dish and we, s and we do not see any uh, right. uh, toxicity issue. But for a long term chronic implants, uh, one has to go through. Um, right, um, right, uh, right. And I, that's true for the whole field or any it, innovation it, it for exactly. that matter. But in, it sounds like, mm -hmm. so far, <laughs> very, very good. Yes. I have to ask, that it seems like when, when I read about this first, I thought, thread, that seems so self-evident, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and But nobody had really done anything with thread. Is mm. that correct? I mean, self-evident, because here it is, it's flexible. And that was one of the big yes. things, uh, big features. Yes. But uh, the, it's new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so sur surprising, some of the best solutions are the simple solutions. Yes, that's you know, often. And yeah, often uh, you, you look at, uh, uh, and this is basically one of the underlying philosophy of doing research, try yeah. to f find right. solutions right. That, are, uh, that are simple and elegant. And when we asked ourselves the, the fundamental question of what would it take to make a sensor uh, for embedded tissues, 
the answer was right there in front of us, which was uh, Isn't that amazing. Yeah. So, so, so the flexibility, as you mentioned, yeah. very, very important. And not just flexibility, even a paper is flexible. Y yeah, but, 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 but we would like to have things that could go in three exactly. dimensions. Exactly. That so, was, yeah. And so we basically, uh, as you mentioned, flexibility in three dimensions yeah. was right. what uh, essentially Threads uh, provide right. us with. It just seems like a big leap forward, but why didn't anybody think of this before? You know, the, the, the idea of the thread. Now, one more thing just to clarify. Thread is coated, is mm -hmm. that it? Thread with is coated with nanomaterials. Material. Right. So nanotechnology it. appears in, uh, in, uh, in the coating yes. uh, of the threads. Okay. And uh, so that we can enhance the surface area. Uh, we can get more sensitivity That's from right. so the it's sensing. Yeah. Completely covered. Uh, completely uh, covered. Right. Um, right. And uh, uh, basically, uh, even the threads themselves uh, uh, could be made of nano fibrous uh, materials. Oh, is that so? Yeah. So if you look at some of the threads that um, uh, that we, if you. Uh, look under the uh, scanning electron microscope or, uh, um, uh, or high resolution microscope. The reason why we have this amazing capillary wicking flow is because of the nanofibrous nature of the threads. So we've been working with nanomaterials all our time. And didn't uh, know. And we didn't know. <laughs> so uh, it's not so, so the cotton threads at yeah. the very front. So we exploit the fact that these materials are nanofibrous. The fact that they can pull the fluid from one end to the other, that, is that these amazing. nanofibers can be coated with other nanomaterials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're still, uh, so essentially these are, uh, I would like to call them nano threads, yeah. uh, even though they look bigger and mi at a micron scale. Yeah. They, they have all the features that you would like to see uh, uh, for doing sensing and uh, microfluid accident drive fluid fluids from one end to the other. This is a very exciting, I'm sure. When you yeah. discovered this, you were probably all very, very pleased because it, it sounds like it makes a great leap forward. You yeah. can do this very careful monitoring mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with something that has, a, uh, that as in surgery, has a lot of risk mm -hmm. with people that are already mm -hmm. uh, compromised mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their immune systems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stuff. And this is just a tremendous advantage. Can you tell us about other things that you do in your lab? I know you do a number of different kinds of things and interdisciplinary. Is that unusual? So uh, I think science, if you look at uh, uh, the problems that are facing the world today, the solutions to those problems are no longer in a given discipline. Mm -hmm. So the traditional mm -hmm. disciplines like electrical engineering or mechanical exactly. engineering as physics yeah. or chemistry that or biology. That cubicle, this cubicle. Yeah, yeah these, right. are, uh, these were formed uh, hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. And the problems that we're facing today, the solutions are at the interdisciplinary level uh, where we have to collaborate and interact with scientists and researchers in other disciplines to come up with solutions to these problems. And nanotechnology is one such field where uh, I use uh, the f physical and chemical properties of nanomaterials to engineer devices. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of physics and chemistry mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is associated with these materials that I have to sort of use in making uh, the devices. And the applications that we are targeting are in medical and life sciences, so we have to interact with doctors and clinicians and even life scientists, uh, mm -hmm, biologists, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to figure out uh, many different applications. So this work itself was a collaboration between myself, I'm an electrical engineer, and a biomedical engineer in, at Tufts. And uh, and uh, Harvard uh, Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital, uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, and uh, we can see working with surgeons and clinical surgeons in the future. So you can see this is a very yes, interdisciplinary. Right, right. And it, it's important to do that. Uh, yes. So, and so uh, the solutions uh, to these kind of challenging problems can only happen when when we have uh, different brains from different uh, disciplines right. work it's together. It's interesting. It's like a whole new organism uh, in in much of research. That's right. Because it is so uh, very t very narrow. It still is in mm. many fields, exactly. and uh, people in certain fields can't even talk to each other exactly. because of these this narrowness. But this is very exciting. That, That's right. You know that you're able to do it. Do you have any other uh, sensor devices well, yes. that you would like? 
like to tell us about? Yes, yeah, so uh, so thread uh, we call this thread diagnostics, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we also uh, have been working on. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, I come from India and from the developing world originally, and so I, I see that uh, we've had so many advances in the world in uh, making diagnostic devices, but they're really not reaching the people yeah. who really need them. And the primary reason is, of course, the cost uh, and the manufacturing cost yeah. and uh, having technology, uh, 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 advanced technologies are sort of localized in Europe and in Japan and North America. But these developing worlds, they don't really have the infrastructure necessary yeah, to sometimes right, make right. these devices. Uh, so we, uh, when we've been doing research in our group, we've been, as we've been asking ourselves, even though this is nanotechnology and people sort of visualize nanotechnology that you require expensive infrastructure, is there a way to do things that we do, not just that we make sensors that are low cost, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but anyone else can also build uh -huh. the sensors we build in our lab. So we call this frugal engineering. <laughs> you know, we, you know it, it's essentially asking ourselves, can we do this at low cost? Yes. And the only driving factor here is, can someone else replicate the sensors we build, the devices we build, so that they can use them locally in their environment. Right. So threads are fabulous because they're ubiquitous. Yes. And so yes. the thread diagnostic and inexpensive. and inexpensive. And so the process we've developed to code these threads are also very simple. Ah. Uh, we've, we've, we've been very mindful of that. And so we, uh, so apart from threads, we work with paper as a substrate. Even paper diagnostics, we call them. This is a field that was uh, started uh, by George Whitesides at Harvard oh University. Oh my goodness! Yes, so he wanted to make things uh, 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 low cost and disposable. So we've been working on making sensors and electronic devices on on, on paper, uh, and uh, uh, sort of the uh, uh, you could say threads is one platform, right. paper is the another right, platform, right. and so we made sensors to monitor uh, uh, infection from uh, a particular bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Oh my goodness. And so, in, and that too uh, in saliva. Yeah. So H. pylori, uh, which is the bacteria I was mentioning, is responsible for a lot of peptic ulcers yes. and stomach yes. cancers. Yes. And so uh, uh, people wouldn't screen for those in developing world. So you have these uh, paper-based sensors that you literally spit on them and it will change its color and oh it will tell goodness. you whether you are uh, it's sort of an early screening method to figure out whether you uh, have uh, this uh, uh, H. pylori in your stomach. Uh, so we've looked at that. We've also looked at some other applications where we monitor pollution uh, using some of these sensors, uh, uh, sort of looking at elevated levels of volatile mm -hmm, organics mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm, air. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, the materials used to make some of these sensors are uh, do have nanomaterials, so carbon nanotubes and graphene, which are carbon-based nanomaterials. And even though these sound uh, um, uh, like they are expensive to make, but the solu people have been able to produce large quantities in solution form. So all you need is, uh, is nanomaterials in solution form, and you can literally print them on paper. Oh, especially this, now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, amazing. So, so you can just essentially use inkjet printing to print yes, these nanomaterials yes, on paper. Yes, that amazing? Exactly. And so this 3D printing and uh, uh, inkjet printing have become uh, sort of uh, the underlying technology by which you can actually make these sensors uh, very easily today. That's amazing because I can see immediately that where we have like uh, Ebola uh, and so on, you could con you could construct something that could be sent to the field rather quickly, exactly. that, and people there could produce the basics if they have the the, raw the fluid part. Right, yes. right. But it it doesn't have you don't have to have a fabulous lab or yes. anything. You're making it available in tents and, yeah. and whatever uh, was on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Correct. I mean you you That's brought fabulous. a very important up like Ebola is one of those anytime yeah. you have an epidemic right. of some kind you would Zika. want to yeah. Zika you want to have sensors that you can literally produce and uh, and distribute and so having uh, a way to manufacture and build devices that are low cost yeah. uh, using locally sourced materials, right. 
with minimum skill, yes. without uh, requiring specialized facilities, yeah. very, very important. That's fabulous. Yeah. But uh, also, that's an enormous human service because so many countries, the bulk of countries, don't have these, uh, you know, the, the, the money for the labs and uh, so on, and the maybe the infrastructure to keep these things funded and, right. and so on. But also, the other thing is that you mentioned that it doesn't take a whole lot of specialized skill. You don't have to have a PhD to do this on the ground. And that means that a lot of people could be drawn into doing medicine and lots of things by this kind of experience. Everybody can help. Yes. That's uh, fabulous. Yes, exactly. And so this essentially democratizing science. And we yeah. want to make sure that more and more people uh, find it uh, uh, fascinating not just to read about it or exactly. see it, but to be able to build it exactly. and see it being used for yes. something that has a very high impact locally. Yes, so it seems to me that's a very unique feature of your lab mm -hmm. that you have had this, co this commitment um, in that way. Uh, is that is there anything else about this fantastic lab? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, we, we do have, uh, apart from doing medical and life sciences work, uh, it's, import we, it's important that we uh, sort of also uh, publicize uh, um, uh, the results that we, uh, that we produce. Uh, and so um, we do have uh, high school students uh, working in the lab. We do have undergraduates, uh, graduate students, postdocs uh, that are actually uh, very much engaged uh, in the research activity um, and all uh, sort of uh, following this uh, underlying philosophy that whatever we build has to be uh, made with uh, uh, the, the environment with uh, uh, in mind that you, this should be something that should be translatable easily into the field and I think uh, uh, the group has been doing phenomenal work in that um, and so there are many other projects uh, beyond life science and medicine, but all have the same sort of underlying Yes, thing. right. Um, so th that uh, people could be in your lab that have diverse interests, yes, uh, and you put all these heads together at, at different times, yes, and uh, that's a very exciting environment yeah, yeah, indeed. Exactly. But I imagine this field by itself is, I can imagine conferences are probably mm. with just lots of new stuff all it, the time. Uh, yes, so there's a lot of activity in the field of nanotechnology. Every day you see lots of very interesting things uh, that are coming up uh, lots of new materials being discovered yeah, the same thing. Uh, yeah every uh, you know they have you know the, the graphene which is a yeah. two-dimensional carbon material won the Nobel Prize a yes. few years ago and now we have new two-dimensional materials uh, uh, there is a lot of research on new uh, uh, materials coming out with amazing physical chemical with properties, properties. And uh, it's like uh, for uh, for a scientist or an engineer at this time, it's like a candy store. I bet it you is. You have a lot of choices right. to work with, a lot of things you can design, yeah. uh, and a lot of things you can build for uh, uh, for not just medical and life sciences, for space applications, yeah, right. for uh, for electric com computing, everything. electrical cars, batteries. Uh, and, and so on. So there's definitely a lot of activity in this yes. field. Yes. May I ask, how did you get into this field? I mean, you know, it. Uh, uh, did you start out in electrical engineering and move toward this, or were as a four-year-old you were already interested in it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, you know, I, I did electrical engineering. Uh -huh. I was always very interested in electronics. Uh, and so my background has been on building circuits. So I like to put things together, <laughs> hands on, see things work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this whole revolution in microelectronics with microfabrication, uh, the ability to make things smaller uh, in the yeah. clean room, uh, yeah. to get transistors that small, uh, to make circuits. Uh, so that's, that essentially was my background. So I was already looking at the advances uh, yeah. in, uh, in making things smaller at nanoscale. Uh, going from micron scale to nanoscale. So it's a field that I was uh, sort of already very well uh, aligned with mm -hmm, in terms of mm -hmm, the activity. Mm -hmm. It's just the application domain that I decided to focus on was different while everyone else was still trying to miniaturize transistors uh, and making computing. I looked at what, what can we do with this amazing technological advance that we have now in making things smaller, can we apply this to medicine and life sciences? So, so many researchers uh, around the world are basically doing mm -hmm, the same. Mm -hmm, They're looking mm -hmm. at taking these 
uh, semiconductor manufacturing uh, processes uh, uh, that allow us to make micron scale and nanoscale devices. So I got into this because I was already doing circuits and electronics and, uh, and uh, everyone was going towards miniaturization. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I wouldn't say that it was something uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, gave me uh, motivation towards it. So basically, I was already very much aligned mm -hmm, with the field. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you bring up the biological thing. That was one of Feynman's points. You know, he said, we should ask the biologist because the, the cell Yes. The single cell is extraordinary. You can't see the thing. It's invisible, and it contains all this information, all these components that have to work together and stuff. And I would imagine somebody interested in circuits would really enjoy looking at that. And then you have done, <laughs> basically. So, There's yeah. a lot of commonality, actually. Yeah, you've pointed out a very good analogy. Cell is a fabulous machinery, it, very yeah, complicated, amazing. and how it does, and even today we are not really replicate. But I would say that with nanotechnology and ability to make these devices mm -hmm. and sensors, mm -hmm. you can at some point in the near future mimic the function of a cell. That would be a good start mm -hmm. to sort of uh, mm -hmm. have fundamentally replicate the entire machinery of the cell using artificial sort of devices, but we are far away. We are still a uh, yeah. uh, long way uh, yeah. to get there. But you are able to penetrate cells at this and point. And monitor and, and, and look at different really, things. It's really, truly definitely. amazing. Yeah. In terms of like the young people coming into this, this field, um, is it very difficult? I mean, especially now you mentioned that it's uh, almost by default, uh, it's got to be interdisciplinary today. <laughs> You've got to have your ear tuned to other uh, people, uh, other experts. Is it, is it a long process for people to train in this field? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have had, uh, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, uh, it, you can enter into the field at any level. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, uh, so the problems uh, facing uh, the planet today are, uh, do have solutions that do not require you to be well versed in almost everything mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. you attempt mm -hmm. the solution. Uh, you could be, you could come at a level where uh, there are aspects of the problem that you can solve. So I have even high school students who come in and you give, you tell them that these nanomaterials fluoresce really brightly. Uh, what can you do with them? It's a, uh, and, and you're already working with nanomaterials. What can you do with them? If I want to monitor something in your tissue and I feel, tell you that these, f these molecules fluoresce and they change their color when mm. they sense this particular molecule, how would you fashion a device? And it's unbelievable how young minds are very creative. If you give them the tools, yeah, they will put yeah, things together. Yeah. And so, uh, so it depends on at what level right. uh, you enter. But I would, so the, our education system is still uh, t uh, has a, uh, a pathway towards getting a four-year degree, then yeah. uh, graduate school and, uh, and postdoc. So, but I've had students work high school, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs at all levels contributing at different levels. And uh, as amazingly, some of these people are co-authors on the things that we publish. So there is definitely opportunities for, so anyone who is interested and is fascinated by this topic just has to raise their hand and say, <laughs> can I get in? I, I know this much and can you give yeah. me the tools to, yeah. to, to, yeah. to sort of work with this? And the answer is, has to be always yes. Because if it's not, then we are not doing uh, our jobs right, essentially, as, as, as an academic. And so very open to looking at problems differently. Uh, we learn at different hierarchies. Yes, you know, right, uh, you'd right. say when you have a postdoc, you probably have much more depth and understanding. Sure, sure. At high school level, you understand the way. But I think there is a lot of opportunities for everyone to yeah, get involved. Right. It's interesting to bring, we think nanotechnology, oh my gosh, that's going to be mm -hmm. so specialized and you're going to have to study for 100 years to, <laughs> no, it's to qualify and stuff. But you're saying absolutely not. You can sort of learn it as you go. Exactly. You can innovate easily if you have a creative person they should be in heaven with this, right. with this. Yeah. absolutely so that's a comforting thought that mm -hmm. people can get
get into it, and I, I imagine that they will. I hope that the media will be more supportive this way and get the word out. I mean, it's in science journals, obviously, right. but you don't see a lot uh, otherwise about this extremely exciting field. So I hope that will be addressed yeah, by I ho I hope that changes the, too. Yes. the media. Mm -hmm. And I hope they shine a light on your lab. Well, they have done, <laughs> but I mean, I hope that they will in the future. It is wonderful to talk talk with you and I really appreciate your efforts. Uh, so good luck and thank you. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful talking to you as well. Great.